Uh, hello, everybody. It's such a great pleasure to be here with you today. I'd like to thank our Associate Dean for Development, Kevin Thompson, who many of you know, who it's such a pleasure and an honor for me to work with. And I would like to um, thank our, as you will hear from her in a moment, our brilliant Chair of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, Professor Penny Burning, who will talk to you in a, a moment. And I would also like to welcome um, in preamble, um, Professor Leila Daravi to speak with us today. This series of talks, as you know, has a, a variety of faculty speaking about their scholarship at different levels, faculty at different levels. We have had some extremely senior faculty speak with us, and we've had some junior faculty speak with us. And I think the breadth of the um, different levels of scholarship and the maturity of research research programs is absolutely fantastic in the College of Science, and it is absolutely fantastic to watch faculty as they grow and mature their research programs. Our faculty study, as you know, everything from the tiniest entities to the entire cosmos. And Professor Duravi, who is from chemistry and chemical biology, is somewhere in between. As you will hear, she has just a brilliant view on how to take take molecules from understanding what molecules are, which is what chemistry is all about, into doing something with those molecules and turning them into innovative products. And the sense of the understanding to product kind of trajectory is for me an incredibly important and exciting aspect of the work that we do in the College of Science. So I welcome you all here. I hope that you, when you get the um, announcement and the flyer about our Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, will look and see what is going on. We so welcome your support of the college and the research in the college. And we thank you so much for being here today with us. And without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Professor Buning, who will Welcome, Professor Duravi. It's a wonderful chain of events here. Thank you so much, Penny. Thank you, Dean Sov. Um, it's great to see so many of you here today, and it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Leila Duravi, who is an assistant professor of chemistry and chemical biology here at Northeastern. She has a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Alabama and a PhD in chemistry from Vanderbilt. And um, she completed postdoctoral work in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard before beginning her independent career at the University of New Hampshire. We were extremely fortunate to recruit her to Northeastern in 2016. Her research at the interface of bioanalytical chemistry, material science, and design aims to build functional materials from self-assembling proteins and biopolymers. Her very exciting research as leader of the biomaterials design group has been recognized with a career award from the National Science Foundation, among many other grants and awards, and her work has attracted extensive media coverage. And she recently started a company called Seaspire with a former graduate student to develop less toxic, more environmentally friendly sunscreens. Welcome everyone, and I'll turn it over to Layla. Thanks, Penny. And thank you, Dean Zo, for the um, very, very kind invitation to share my work to everybody today. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen and jump right in if that's okay with everyone. Um, so as ben, Penny and Dean so said, I am gonna be talking about some of the research that we're doing that's largely at the interface of all things science and all things applied sciences as well. And I have have this title here listed, which is a little bit futuristic. So kind of bear with me as I kind of get you up to speed on, on why I've chosen the title that I have. Um, but the title and the topic that I'll be discussing is just from molecules to machines, how we can incorporate these self-assembling proteins and biomolecules into next generation electronics. Um, but before I begin, I always like to just kind of spend a minute acknowledging my team and my, my all of the collaborators that have taken part in the work that I'll be discussing. So as Penny had mentioned, our work call, we call ourselves the Biomaterials Design Group. And that's pretty much because we take a lot of the chemicals and biomolecules that we study and we put those into materials. So the design aspect of our work is really, it's a common thread throughout every single thing that we do. Um, our group is super interdisciplinary. We have people from food scientists with backgrounds there, from engineers, material scientists, 
chemists, we have postdocs all the way to a bunch of undergraduates that we incorporate into the lab every semester. And because it's sort of the interdisciplinary nature of, of our group, we rely on the expertise of a number of different collaborators. A few of them are listed here. Um, but it's also a really great opportunity to have the students and postdocs get a handle on how to use their fundamental chemistry knowledge into a bunch of different applications. So we really do rely on, on the expertise of our collaborators to help us get us there. Um, our lab is located on campus in Herdick Hall. And so this is um, where we are. This is the snapshot of pre-COVID times, which is a beautiful layout. We've got some nice green grass in front of the building. It's, it's a great time to talk science and to you know, get outside a little bit as well. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in and tell you a little bit first about the group and then more specifically about one project that we are really excited about and we've um, seen a lot of success over the past few years since I've started at Northeastern. But in general, our group, like I said, because we do biomaterials work, essentially what that means is that we look at um, small molecules and proteins and we try to figure out ways of how to interface those components with something that's living. So either humans or, or living things in the environment as well. And generally our research can be classified into sort of three silos where we look, which are kind of defined here um, along with the associated videos and pictures. And I hope that you all are as, as graphically oriented as I am because I have a ton of videos and a lot of dynamic pictures as well and, and throughout the talk um, to help you kind of guide you through my own journey and our lab's journey through, through research and exploration. Okay, so back to science. So one of the first topics that we look at in the group is what we call fibrillogenesis. And essentially what that is, is we take inspiration from how proteins come together in the body to make tissue. So for example, how does something like a load bearing tissue, like your Achilles tendon in your, in your ankle, how does that work? And all that is, is essentially are these individual proteins that come together, then couple, polymerize, and then grow these amazing, beautiful strands of fibers that you can see here. So this is just one snapshot of collagen fibers within an Achilles tendon. And in the group, we study how this happens. So from the small molecule level, we build tools and devices in the lab where we're able to track very similar processes. And so that's what these two images are here on the bottom is an example of something that we do, which is inkjet printing to pattern down different protein layers where we can actually trigger a spontaneous assembly of these protein layers to make very aligned continuous fibers, just like you would have in your Achilles tendon. And um, we track this also with a lot of chemical tools. So with spectrophotometry, and this is sort of a, a graphic illustration of one of those pieces of data that we would collect, which is the organization and the transformation of how proteins come together and assemble to form these really intact structures like muscle. And we also have devices that we custom design in the lab as well to test the performance of the fibers and the structures that we make. And this is an example here where we have a mechanical tester that's just pooling on our synthetic muscle. And the idea is that we would eventually be able to translate these technologies into the clinic and have somebody be able to, you know, be able to implant our materials um, into someone who's had an Achilles rupture. Another area of research that we look at in the group is, is something that we call bionics, which is essentially protein integrated electronics. So how do we take proteins that are naturally occurring in our body and repurpose them and be able to embed alternative functionality into their system? So things like how do you put electronic features um, or Im embedded features that can give you more high performing um, capabilities. And one of the examples that we have inspiration from are called marine diatoms. So these are unicellular algae and essentially what this is, is if you go to the beach and you put your feet into the sand, each one of the sand particles there looks like this under a very high resolution microscope. So there are these beautiful bilaterally symmetric structures that have these really precisely ordered nanostructures all throughout the surface. So they're kind of like snowflakes. Every one of the little sand particles are very unique. And what's really cool is that sand is essentially silicon dioxide, which is the most common insulator that anybody has in their electronic devices. And the way that sand forms is through a protein mediated reaction. So we study that self-assembly mechanism and we build things like nanostructures, we build materials that can form coatings of different colors. And we also are doing something that's very exciting in the lab that we call chemomechatronic systems, which is essentially integrating and tightly coupling the chemistry and the mechanics of a moving system to be able to have embedded electronics through it. And so we have this one video that's kind of cycling back and forth in the PowerPoint where you can see this is an example of how we have 
a protein-based hydrogel, so a squishy kind of jello-like material that's actually causing a shape change that's completing a circuit here. And that circuit, once it completes, it turns on an LED and that shows the complete electrical circuitry and wiring um, of these systems. And then finally, and what I'm gonna be spending the majority of my time in this talk is gonna be on some of the work that we do on bio-optics. So how do natural systems and biology uh, manipulate light essentially? Our model system in the group is called the cephalopod. So I, if you're not familiar with this family of, um, of animals, I'll well, really explain what it is in a few slides, but they include animals like squid and octopus. And this is actually a image of a cuttlefish. And you'll notice these are actually the same animal here. And you'll notice that the color and the three-dimensional texture change, or they're very different in both pictures. And I'll tell you why. Um, in, in our group, we study how this happens and we build a lot of materials based off of that as well. But before I get into the real, the meat of what I want to tell you all about, I want to just give, make sure to calibrate everybody to the same level and make sure just to share um, sort of why this drives us as a lab and why all everybody in the lab is so keen on understanding why this works. And to do so, I'm just going to blast you with pictures right now. And, and that's really primarily to share and to um, emphasize that there are many, many, many beautiful colors, textures, patterns that persist all throughout nature. And this is really, really important to get a handle on, okay, how are these coming about and why is it that there are certain colors that emerge in certain systems and why aren't they in other systems? This is primarily important because sight is responsible for 80% of all impressions. And so that makes vision and being able to perceive these colors and the textures across multiple systems in biology the most important sensory system when taken cumulatively. Um, and you'll notice I even sort of threw in a picture here of my almost two-year-old no matter what species it is in biology, that color is sort of what persists and the textures and the patterns are what persist as sort of a first sign of signaling on what, how things are um, communicating through, throughout biology. And when you take a look at all things color and structure and pattern, the way that you can kind of further understand what's happening is to sort of segment it into two different classes. The first of these classes can be categorized as pigmentary based coloration and that's just molecular based coloration that's when small molecules come about and absorb light. Um, and that's most prominently seen in these kind of with kind of brown and orange and yellowy colors. Um, and that's all molecular based color, so small molecule, the chemistry. That's very, very different from structural based coloration, which persists um, in really ordered nanostructures. And two examples that I'm showing here are really capture that very significantly. And this is seen in the nape feathers of a bird of paradise, where this is kind of its mating calls. It's kind of moving its neck back and forth, calling its mates. And you can see those really, really bright blue, green, orangey colors that sort of persist in on these feathers. And that's it's kind of similar to what's happening here with this marine copepod that's kind of flipping back and forth in the ocean. You can see in one viewing angle, you don't see a color. In another viewing angle, you see that really bright sapphire-based coloration that's shining from the surface of the structure. And in both of these cases, whenever you see that really bright, brilliant, shimmery kind of color, these all come about because on the surface of these animals, they have these really precisely positioned nanostructure. So in feathers of the bird of paradise, they have melanin-based nanoparticles that are arranged very precisely, and that's what these high-resolution microscopy images are meant to represent. And this enables light to refract or reflect right off the surface of the structures. And this is different from the copepod here that gives that bright blue colors. They're actually made out of um, hexagonally closest packed nanoparticles, which is what these structures are on the bottom, these nanostructures here. Um, so it's all based off of size and arrangement and structure. And what's really, really remarkable actually about the class of animals that we study in the lab, so the cephalopod family, and I'm sure you guys have all just been watching this video as it's been looping back and forth, both in slow motion reverse and in real time forward motion, is that the cephalopod, so the, the octopus, for example, in this video, has these remarkable, very, very, very fast color change, texture change um, abilities. And that's because it's so unique to other systems in biology in the sense that it incorporates both pigmentary and structural based coloration 
really, really tightly intertwined together to give rise to these really dynamic, very, very fast response optical changes that you can see there. And so in this video, when you watched how the octopus sort of emerged out of nowhere, essentially, what's happening is that the deep sea diver, so one of our um, close collaborators, Roger Hanlon, was going and trying to find where the octopus was, startled the octopus, it spooked, and then it swam away, inked, and, and many of you probably know that the inking is the defense mechanism, and then um, sort of increased its um, surface area, and that's sort of its defensive stance, and that's what happened at the end of the video. But it's remarkable how these systems work, and it's crazy that they even exist at all. And so my group is driven by this. We want to figure out why is this working, and then what can we do with the information that we get once we figure out how it is, in fact, working. And this kind of is the crux of what we're doing right now in the lab, which is trying to build these cephalopod-inspired technologies. And we're not the only ones in the, in the world that are trying to do this. In fact, there are a number of different really, really amazing, incredible researchers who are doing very similar things. And I've just highlighted only three of those examples here on the slide next to the actual video itself. And these come, like I said, all over the world, but essentially what you can see are different approaches to how to build what are called these cephalopod inspired technologies. So these color changing adaptive systems. And so whether it's a black and white system, whether it's, this is actually a fluorescent image. So it's, you have to use a microscope to be able to image the different colors that are emerging. And in this case, they also were able to do shape changes as well. And then in this bottom image, this isn't um, visible color, this is infrared color. So being able to sh uh, shutter on and off the infrared coloration of a specific pattern. And here they pattern an actual squid to, to mimic that, that appearance and disappearance feature. So in all of these cases, there's really, really complicated integrated controls and electronics that help inspire and engage these types of different patterns and structures to emerge. But none of them, as you can see, closely replicate how the animal is working. And so that really is what motivated when I was starting my own independent career, I really what was motivated me personally was to figure out how is there such a huge disconnect between the available technologies that are out there today and how these animals work in, in their natural habitat, which is essentially just an underwater optical display. And when I kind of took a closer look at this and looked at sort of the system parameters that were involved with how these animals work, one of the things that you'll see, and I, I kind of highlighted those here at the bottom is that not only do these animals change colors really, really fast, so hundreds of milliseconds is the time where it can in, engage and trigger a color response, but it also does so at such low, low voltages, so less than two volts. And just to calibrate you on really what that means and where the state of the art is, in many of these cases, you see that they're using kilovolts, so thousands of volts to be able to trigger their color changes in these synthetic technologies. And so one of the things that really drove us then was to figure out how are these animals working? How are they engaging color change underwater? And then what can we extrapolate from their principles and incorporate into, let's say, lower uh, power requirements that are associated with color changes that could maybe better replicate these systems in general? Um, so we took sort of a reductionist approach. And instead of working with octopus who are, who are actually considered to be intelligent animals, so you, you can't do laboratory research on them, exploratory laboratory research on them. Um, instead, we work with the squid, which you can see this is, <laughs> this is some from the whole organism level. It kind of just chills on the ocean floor. The squid doesn't do anything, to, depending on the species, it doesn't do anything as extravagant or dramatic as the octopus. But that's OK with us because we're able to get squid really readily off of Cape Cod here. So locally, we get fresh squid. And also, if you kind of think about, um, I like to think about the difference between squid and octopus, just using an analogy that makes sense to me, which is thinking about different resolution displays. So if you're going to a store and you want to buy a really high resolution TV, you look at the DPI, essentially. So the dots per inch that give rise to the different colors and the different uh, quality of colors that can emerge from your screen. So an octopus would be analogous to a really high resolution, high DPI display. The squid, it's got the same components, 
but it's got a fewer number of dots per inch. So it's got, it's a lower resolution display, fewer number of DPI, but that's okay with us because essentially what we're doing in the lab is we're trying to isolate those dots and we're trying to figure out what are those dots or those individual pixels that give rise to these really dramatic displays um, that emerge throughout these animals. And so what we do, you can see from the whole animal to the tissue and the single cellular level is that we're trying to isolate these individual dots and pixels or the biological term is chromatophores, and we're trying to figure out what is inside of these organs that are giving rise to these dynamic displays. And if you take a cross section, if you just kind of take a chunk out of the animal skin, what you'll see throughout all of these cephalopods is that they have this really precisely organized skin texture that's able to give rise to its different features. And that is that it's pixelated with yellow chromatophores that are on top of red chromatophores that are precisely on top of brown chromatophores. And all of these chromatophores are layered directly on top of what's called iridophore cells, which is just a mirror. It's a protein-based mirror that's underneath all of the different pixels in the animal skin, and it allows for the structural-based coloration to emerge. So there's a lot going on, but we're trying to decouple. What I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that we're, we're looking at how to simplify this model system so that we can start to piece out what's going on at the molecular level for how this thing is undergoing color change. And when we took a look at this, it was actually really curious at the time because there, it was kind of an understudied area in, in the literature. So when we went back into the scientific literature, the last um, anatomical drawing or hy hypothesized configuration of these chromatophore organs was back in the 60s, where it was hypothesized that there was this central pigment sac that gave the color, the, the pigmentary color. And surrounding that pigment sac was this kind of fluffy cytoelastic matrix, which is represented by this sort of fluffy-ish, you know, area around that pigment sac. And this cytoelastic matrix is then anchored by these muscle cells, so radial muscle cells, which allow for it to contract and open up the sac and then close it. And that the muscle cells themselves were innervated directly by nerve, the nervous system, so the central nervous system. So that kind of started to piece together elements where it's a little bit more complicated now when you look at these organs because it, it makes it sound like there's neuromuscular control that's guiding the opening and closing so the shuttering of these individual display elements that populate all over the skin of the animals. And that's exactly where we started in this project was to figure out what is actually in the skin of these animals. And so we had worked on this for a while and the, one of the first things that we did was looked at okay, what is the abundance of um, nerve positive dyes? So we actually stain, so just tag different elements of the skin with different markers that were associated with performance. And one of the things that you'll see in this top image here is the red sort of veins that persist all throughout the chromatophore skin, so the chunk of tissue. Um, this red color is associated with axons from different nerve cells, so it's alpha tubulin positive staining. So that was kind of a first instance where we were able to say, all right, we do have confirmation now that you have sort of this wiring this from the central nervous system that's all throughout the skin of the animal. And you can see here the individual chromatophores are the, they're just the little circles that you see all throughout the image as well. Um, and then around the same time, there were some other groups from, um, uh, again, all over the world where they identified that there's that fluffy kind of sacculous type of material that's on the outside that also stain positive for different types of extraocular receptors like retinochromes and rhodopsin. So those are things that you have in your eye that allow for you to, to signal in to your brain what you're actually seeing from the surroundings. So having that positive staining there indicates that these chromatophore organs actually might behave and perform as extraocular receptors. So essentially that is to say that these organs could perhaps function as an eye of the animal as well. And it actually adds to another complex element of these animals in the sense that they are actually reported to be colorblind. So their own eyes can't see color. So it makes it even more important for their skin to be able to sense and see and then respond so quickly to the color around it to be able to engage on those different colors and patterns and textures from the surrounding. Um, so more recently, my group has been sort of obsessed with, all right, what is actually happening on these chromatophore organs? What is this fluffy matrix that's surrounding it? Is it 
really jam packed full of these extraocular receptors or what in fact is it? And so we have, we, we're part of a team where we led this really multidisciplinary um, group all over sort of New England and beyond where we try to identify exactly what is the composition of the chromatophore um, from the protein molecular level up and then how is that contributing to color. And so we identified that this fluffy white matrix around the chromatophore organs is what we're calling sheath cells. So it's essentially just a bunch of a bunch of cells that will enable flexibility of these organs. And then if you take a closer look with a high resolution, ultra high resolution microscope, what you end up seeing is those sheath cells actually comprise what we believe to be these interdigitated arrays. And you can kind of see those with this high resolution microscope all around the central pigment sac. So these interdigitated arrays which we believe are pretty important to the color that's coming off of these structures. And so we spent some time also trying to figure out what on the molecular level are these things composed of. And we developed lots of streamlined procedures where we take the sections of the skin, isolate individual chromatophore cells, do uh, massive proteomic studies. And it's been incredible being at Northeastern because we have access to really phenomenal facilities here through the Barnett Institute, which I'm a part of as well. And we're able to do these deep data dives and deep sequencing processes, um, looking at things all the way from like transcriptomic in, um, analysis to how that translates to the proteome and being able to see what's actually inside of these structures. And you'll see through a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of experiments, and this is kind of really highlighted in one very simple graph here, is that we saw a lot of things, but two things that were really important and exciting to us are highlighted in the red structures in these bar graphs here, and that's the abundance of what's called the reflectin protein, and then the lens crystalline family of proteins as well. And why this is important is because, and it's kind of a pretty dense data slide here, but reflectin as a protein is the only cephalopod specific protein. So it's a very, very unique protein and it does actually a lot of different things in the animal, including self-assembling as the primary structural element that forms that iridophore layer. So remember I was telling you, if you take that chunk out of the skin, the iridophore layer is actually what is um, the mirror that reflects the structural color from the surroundings. So this protein can self-assemble into structural features that can reflect off a bunch of different light that span the entire visible spectrum, which is highlighted in this graph here. So it forms these plates, it can reflect different colors of lights. And then actually more recently, it's been shown that these proteins also self-assemble and perform as proton conductors. So it's able to, what we call in scientific terms, sort of transduce signal um, all throughout the skin as well. So really, really important features. So now we were saying, all right, we know that this one specific protein is responsible for giving structural base coloration, which you remember when I told you the very beginning are the bright kind of blues and greens and yellows coming off of different structures. We wanted to see is structural color actually inside of the chromatophores as well. And in fact, what we found through um, a, the help of our really, really fantastic collaborators is that yes, indeed, we see very, very similar types of structural elements of coloration emanate from the chromatophores themselves. And actually you can't, the, the video that I actually love the most out of all of all of these experiments that show this is this one video at the bottom here where you can really get an appreciation of how important this finding is when you see these chromatophore organs pop out. So just like an, an optical shutter, they pop in and out so quickly and when they pop out in a blink of an eye, you can see that really, really bright sheen that's kind of emanating from these structures. And so this is a, the first instance that we believe that we've been able to find or anyone's been able to find this flexible type of um, dynamic structural elements of colorations that are so tightly integrated with the pigmentary based structural element, um, elements of coloration as well. And when we looked in a lot closer, we actually were able to see and staying positive that inside of those, remember I was telling you those interdigitated arrays that surround that central pigment sac, actually what we found was that the reflectin protein, that structural base protein is actually really embedded within all of those features. And we found that using microscopy. So we took just a microscope and we were able to label those proteins on the edges of that pigment sac. And we were able to find that they were specific to those types of arrayed features that all surround those sheath cells on the outside of the pigment sac. But that's not all. So all, all I've told you so far is just the structural base coloration. But one of the other things that's really important, and I'm sure you've already noticed, is that there is an actual visible color, the pigmentary coloration 
that's also a really important feature of these of these chromatophore organs. And that's sort of what is on the inside of these structures. So these individual nanoparticles inside the pigment sac. And one of the things that we spent a lot of time, so again, just the combination of amazing students and amazing, you know, both undergraduates and graduate students who come into the lab and they have this same deep intellectual curiosity and they able, they're able to sort of couple in with me and go head first into figuring out what is on the inside of these tiny, tiny nanostructures. This is probably like three years worth of work that we did all highlighted in just one slide. <laughs> but um, essentially what we did were we were able to take and develop a from scratch procedure to be able to selectively isolate and extract the small molecule components of that pigmentary based coloration from these tiny, tiny nanoparticles that populate uh, the insides of the chromatophores. And it, that's kind of represented here in this um, workflow diagram where we isolate all those nanoparticles. And what we, what we start with is this kind of brown, gross, murky solution. We selectively isolate the pigmentary portion, which we've been able to identify through a bunch of experiments to be these two components here, which are xanthomatin and decarboxylated xanthomatin. And what we're left with are tiny, tiny nanoparticles that have no color really at all. So no um, pronounced color at all. So not only were we able to track that with the small molecule portion, but we were also able to track those exact same uh, components with proteomics and transcriptomics. And this again is really, I just wanna highlight how important this was for us at the time, which is in 2019 when this paper came out because the, the genome of the squid wasn't fully sequenced and it's still, that, that piece of work is coming out soon. Um, so we were, had to really rely and lean heavily on a bunch of collaborators and a bunch of our um, collaborators here at Northeastern who helped us kind of piece together this story to be able to put this out um, in this body of work. But again, so one of the major elements that we identified inside of these tiny nanoparticles was this abundance of the crystalline family of proteins. So crystalline, again, being the primary protein that's predominant inside of, inside of human lenses as well. So again, an, an optical protein that's coupling in that we found, again, abundant inside of these chromatophore organs. And so now I'm going to kind of shift gears away from the protein small molecule stuff. And I'm going to tell you a little bit now with the remaining time that I have. And please flag me down, Dean Siv, whenever I'm going over in my talk too. Um, but I'm going to talk more now about the application space that we're going into based off of all these findings that we had from the protein level and the small molecule level. And the, where I want to start with this story is actually to tell you about some of the things that we're doing with the pigment molecule now that we're synthesizing in the lab. So the central pigment that we've identified in these animals and we're building actually single pixel displays that can shuttle different types of color over a broad spectrum. And that's kind of represented here in these colors up at the top. And what these devices actually look like is that we have our central pigment that we have incorporated that's represented by this XA, which is xanthomatin. And it's sort of sandwiched between two transparent electrodes. And all of this is powered by something very similar to a button battery. So if any of you have ever had to change your battery in your watch, that's essentially what's powering these devices. So really low voltages is the key that I want to drive home. So less than two volts. Um, and we're triggering different types of colors that are emerging in our devices just based off of using the squid pigment itself. So a really exciting finding uh, where we're able to shuttle, like I said, different colors over a over multi, multiple hours of uh, performance cycling. And so here we, I actually like to show this graph because it does illustrate sort of the human side of device design, because what we do at the start is we're able to trigger different colors, which we've represented here by percent transmission at an optical wavelength of 550 nanometers, which is where your human eye is most sensitive to detecting light. And you can see as you're triggering different colors to emerge and cycling over a bunch of different hours, you start to see the decrease in optical performance over time. So you're starting to see the device break down. And I've talked to a couple of different people about this. And, and as it turns out, when we're building our devices, we're actually seeing a loss of device performance just because our central material, so the electrolyte that we're buying off the shelf, not our pigment, but the electrolyte that we're buying off the shelf and embedding into our system is actually starting to break down. So we're having to look into different types of innovative processes to be able to incorporate new electrolytes to extend the performance of our device. 
So, but at the end of the day, we're still, you know, limited by sort of engineering uh, pieces right now, but we're really, really excited about the potential of these pigments to be new color changing platforms. And another thing that I just wanted to highlight here is this kind of uh, gnarly looking graph here on the corner, which is a, called an XY chromaticity diagram. And if you've never seen it, again, this is meant to really encompass human visual perception. So what do we see as humans coming out of these different colors? And um, we're able to map our, the specific colors that we're generating on these, on these chromaticity diagrams, which give you an indication of where we are right now with the different colors that we can generate. And we're actually super excited and we're not quite ready to share yet, but being able to enter into the different color spaces like the greens and then the blues as well by just modifying the chemistry of these central pigments themselves. Um, but another thing that we're super, super exciting, excited about is translating this technology from a single pixel to multiple different pixelated displays. And this is something that's ongoing now that's been really driven by fantastic postdocs and fantastic undergraduates in our lab. It is incredible for chemistry undergraduates to come to me and say, hey, Layla, I'm super open to doing these integrated electronic systems that can do these, you know, multi-pixelated color displays. And so we, like, we love it too. And we love sort of the exploration of the unknown in the lab. And that's kind of what's represented in all these proof of concept demos that you can see here, which is the blast of color again, coming at you. But essentially what this is, again, are just proof of concept demos where instead of using our individual pixelated um, squid pigment devices, I'm using in this case, these are LEDs as sort of proxies to those pixelated devices, just to give you a really dynamic visual aid to show you where we're going with this research, which again, is these integrated displays, which we believe we're trying to emulate things like the cuttlefish. So this is cuttlefish hypnosis, which is controlled by directional dimming. And that's illustrated in this LED um, directional dimming demo that you can see here. And then also this demo on the side, which this is the reference image, is something that we're super excited about moving forward with, which is the ability to not only sense the color underneath, but also display colors that are very specific to um, optical triggers. So in this case, you only see those green LEDs shining when they are on top of the red pixels that are under underlying those patterns there. So really exciting next steps for where we're going in this whole um, cephalopod inspired display technology space. But I want to kind of take a step back and say, all right, we're doing a lot with electronics, which is kind of far out for chemists in general. But what about things that we can do with just chemistry and small molecules? And at the time that we started exploring all this stuff, I had a student, Camille Martin, who is a PhD student in my group, who came to me and said, Layla, my passion is cosmetic chemistry. Do you have anything that I can do in the lab to be able to explore this and develop new innovative materials and look at new innovative platforms? And so we developed from scratch a whole um, project based off of exploring the utility of these pigments as color changing cosmetics. And that's exactly what you see in this video and represented by these images here. And essentially what Camille was able to show is that you can embed these squid pigments, again, things that we're now synthesizing in the lab um, on a pretty large scale and put them into what we call skin uh, proxies. So we use hydrogels where we're able to embed these pigments on, on the inside of the um, hydrogels. And just by ap applying something, uh, a, ch it's a chemical reducing agent, which is ascorbic acid, which is just vitamin C essentially, by applying that, um, in, in this case, Camille had actually developed an applicator that's kind of like a lip gloss, you can actually induce a color change, a very dynamic color change over time where you can really see the richness of the red that's emerging from those colors um, after about 10 minutes. And that color is pretty consistent and, um, and pretty stable actually when you change that color um, after for about a few days afterwards. So this is the first application that we're able to show the utility of this new class of pigment molecules uh, for color changing cosmetics and stuff like that. But Camille didn't actually stop there. She took this one step further and went deep into the literature and she actually got super driven by the current state of affairs with over-the-counter sunscreens. And I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with what's happening in this space. Um, it's being completely overhauled by the FDA, which is to say that current chemicals and over-the-counter sunscreens are now being sort of marked and uh, discussed as kind of being systemically toxic to your body and also to the environment. So they've been linked to things like coral reef bleaching and the decline of uh, 
respiratory features of the coral reefs as well. So currently Hawaii and some areas off of Key West have banned the utility of things like copper tones, so over-the-counter sunscreens that have these pretty toxic chemicals inside of them. And then also more recently, so last year, the FDA re released this report um, in the Journal of America, American Medical Association um, that reported systemic toxicities associated with key chemicals in these sunscreens as well. So that kind of drove Camille on a personal level to say, all right, how can we think about creating and utilizing chemicals that are found in the ocean to go back into the ocean as eco-friendly sunscreens. And so then she like did a deep exploration in the utility of these squid pigment molecules as alternative sunscreens. And that's kind of what's represented in all of these graphs here. I know it's, a, again, a lot of data, but I wanted to jam it as much as I could to, to tell you this story um, because it is really important where she was able to show that these pigments actually, they're broad spectrum absorbers. So they outperform current sunscreens, so the more toxic sunscreen chemicals um, by, by a lot. And they're also photostable. And they're also, importantly, they're cytocompatible. So that's what this graph here shows, is that they maintain almost 100% compatibility with cells. And also something really interesting that she found was that these compounds behave as free radical scavengers, because another kind of bad feature associated with these chemicals and sunscreens today is that they not only are the photo unstable, but they're also kind of breaking down and, and creating lots of different crazy cascades in the skin. And so now we're showing that this squid pigment is actually capable of scavenging a lot of the uh, negative byproducts that are coming about um, by, by the other chemicals that are there in sunscreens. Um, and, and more excitingly, Camille has since left the lab. So this is a picture of Camille. She since left the lab, got her PhD in 2019 and started this company, Ceasefire Skincare, which has received venture back um, financing and has also been recognized by a couple of different programs um, for exciting innovation to come. So we're really excited to see how this space evolves and the utility of, of safer, eco-friendly sunscreens and um, really excited to see how that's gonna shape out but again, so that's kind of, I, I know I just said a lot of words that you all and a lot of different projects that we're working on, but I do want to start to wrap up here and I know my time is coming to an end. Um, but this is an overview of really what the lab does in general. So from the proteomics, and I tried to touch on each of these individually, although I didn't have time to flesh out a lot of it, but from the protein level to the molecular level and things that I didn't get to talk about are a lot of the work that we're doing on the optical analysis. So looking at how light comes into these structures and how they bounce back out and where they go and how they're performing. Um, and we spend a lot of time thinking about that as well. I told you a bit about the color and I've told you a little bit about the color change that we're trying to achieve and the different color spaces that we want to go into. Um, I told you some of the color filtering stuff that we're doing in the, in the UV range, but we also look at a lot of things in the infrared as well. Um, and this has a lot of important implications for um, a, a couple of different consumer processes as well. We're looking at incorporating these pigments into things like textiles that are flexible, either directly into fabric, so dyeing fabrics directly, or creating fibers from scratch by incorporating the, the pigments in there as well. But again, at the end of the day, no matter how you shake it, what really drives our research and what really drives our lab is to understand the fundamentals behind color and color change in these animals. And there's no uh, better way to illustrate that by just looking again at these two beautiful videos side by side the one of an octopus that's fully loaded with all of its chromatophores intact, and a one of an octopus which recently, so in 2016, was um, identified by a, a NOAA deep sea rover. They call it Casper, the ghost-like octopod. So cute. Um, but this is an octopus that is devoid of chromatophores, has no chromatophores, and this is a real-time video. So you'll notice that not only is the octopus slower, but it's anatomically very different from an octopus with a fully loaded system of chromatophores. And this kind of, this is the stuff that really drives us and drives our research is that trying to figure out what is in fact the role of these chromatophores. Is it really in, in responsible for directing the entire circuitry and the entire sort of anatomy and physiology of these animals as they undergo color change? Um, and if so, how can we leverage that to build smarter, better, safer materials for both humans and the environment? And so with that, I will stop my presentation and thank you all so much for listening. And thank you for, again, for the invitation to talk today too. That is brilliant. Professor Daravi, thank you so much. What a absolutely visually beautiful presentation and the notion of taking the 
discoveries from the fundamentals of thinking, wow, what a cool kind of animal to actually um, these very high tech discoveries and in inventions regarding sunscreens and, um, you know, possibly cosmetics and other aspects that use natural pigments, just really fantastic. I'm, I'm looking at the questions here and encouraging anyone in the audience. Um, if you know me, you will know that my I really emphasize um, there is no question that is stupid if you want to know something please do ask it that's um, any level of question that you think is fantastic to ask um, there's a couple of questions I, I have one question for you about the sunscreen you know I think the I think it's fantastic I love your sunscreens that make use of natural pigments I think it's brilliant do you think that there's a toxicity to those as well are there you know, concerns there about toxicity when you take the pigments out of their natural environment that, you know, th there may be a whole nother level of toxicity we don't understand there. And how are you dealing with this in your company? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And I think that's, that's something we think about all the time. So these pigment molecules are actually super interesting in the sense that they are metabolites of a, a one common amino acid tryptophan. So tryptophan sort of morphs and evolves itself to form these structures that are inherently photostable. Um, so we're looking at things like if you blast this pigment with a massive amount of ultraviolet light or solar simulated light, how is it going to break down? And it turns out it's pretty actually pretty stable. The only time you see it start to break down and morph into different types of structures is if it's in different types of uh, reaction solvents. And so we're trying to better understand what how do the different um, reaction environments cause or why does it cause the, the core molecule to sort of shift into different structures? And then also another unknown is then what happens to the um, cytocompatibility features. And so essentially, long story short to what your question was, is that we don't have those answers yet, but we believe because of the way that these pigments have evolved and the fact that they are programmed inside the natural organisms to be photostable, um, we believe these are really good indicators that they will be, the synthetic forms will be as well. If, if not, there's a lot of different strategies that are uh, available to us, a lot of different chemical strategies to be able to protect the core molecule so that we can enhance the stability itself um, and even package it in a way so that the, the any types of products or um, breakdown features will be kind of all packaged together nicely so it won't go out necessarily into the atmosphere, into the ocean, um, the way that it's being done currently in over-the-counter sunscreens. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. Um, there's a question here from, from Karen. Can chromatophores be synthesized or do they have to be harvested from cephalopods? Yeah, chromatophores as an organ, they're, that's a very interesting question because you can imagine being able to make synthetic analogs. And there are actually a lot of really, really recent publications um, out there there that are creating these chromatophore, um, synthetic chromatophore structures, which are just engineered systems designed to um, capture the, the natural features inside the animals. Um, so yeah, I, I think it is a reality that that could possibly happen, you know, within the next few years. It's, there's a lot that's been been underway already on it. That's very interesting. That sounds like a very high tech yeah. Culture, right? That's a sounds. Uh, are, are you trying that in your own research group to try we, to synthesize mm, to, to yeah. differentiate cells into chromatophores? Oh, to differentiate cells. Oh, geez. No, we're doing a totally synthetic version of it. So we're building oh, totally synthetic. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Oof, yeah. Oof. Differentiating cells into chromatophores could be quite challenging, I think, but um, not impossible. I don't think there's been a lot of really incredible advances that have been made over the past couple of years to, to maybe point to this might be a possibility. Um, but yeah, synthetically in the lab, that's something that we're very interested in. We're working on actually currently, um, which is to create synthetic chrom chromatophores from scratch. So let me clarify, let me extend Karen's question a bit because I think it's a very good question. Um, do you mean as in artificial cells? Artificial, artific not artificial cells. No. Not artificial cells, sort of artificial parts of cells. Exactly. The, the, the substructures of cells, the organelles, and you're trying to build an artificial 
organelle, an artificial exactly. cellular exactly. structure. Wow. Just by using like off the shelf chemicals and off the shelf electronics to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple more questions. You know, when you look at these um, chromatophores that are so um, informative from the cephalopods, are there other classes of organism that you could get different kinds of chromatophores from with different pigments and different properties that could have even a greater spread of applications? Yeah, amazing question. Yes, the answer is yes. There are every, well, I don't wanna say that. A lot of fish in the sea have chromatophores and they have chromatophores that do a lot of different things. So I would say I'm biased, but the cephalopods have the most incredible, extraordinary chromatophores. But there are chromatophores that have um, really, really interesting sort of shimmery properties associated with it, um, different pigments in there as well. So a lot of different performances. But yeah, I, I absolutely think that the, the platform that we've used now to isolate the pigments and isolate the substructures from the chromatophores can definitely be applied to a bunch of different other species in biology, which is, which is exciting. That is outstanding. Um, um, there's a question here that, that says, I think you said reflectin is unique to cephalopods. Are there known possibly distant relatives of this protein in other organisms? That is a very great question. Um, very hard question to answer because it's, it's, we don't really know. No, we don't know. Because I think when we look at sort of the phylogeny of the cephalopod, and, and we've studied this too, just as chemists trying to, trying to figure out where everything is coming from and where things have evolved in the ways that they have. Um, it is there. There is a significant um, derailment of the stuff of specifically of the octopus squid and cuttlefish, which differ throughout um, evolution from all the other species. So I, I would be curious to see if there is something comparable in other systems, or whether this protein is evolved in other systems, um, or if it is if it is truly specific just to these animals. That is a great question, and I do not have the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think um, your work highlights so beautifully um, the progression from fundamental discoveries through the understanding and into um, applications that have got both commercial but also environmentally very sound um, projections. And this notion of, you know, fundamental all the way through to the applications is so foundational for chemistry, not just for your work, but for other work that is going on in the department and I think you know this is where um, the those of you who are in the audience who are thinking about the chemistry department um, can understand and can get your heads around where the um, actual support that you are considering giving us and that we're so grateful to you for considering really goes from fundamental to application it's just a, it's a brilliant way of working and um, I think it's part and part of how our chemistry department works and just absolutely fascinating about this. And, and Penny, I don't know if you want to chime in there in this um, sort of end of the discussion wrap up part to talk a bit more about the chemistry department and how this fundamental nature of chemistry um, that is one thread of your department and the matching of you know the other thread that is, is more of the synthetic part of the department. If you wanted to say a few words about about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is a really beautiful example of kind of multiple areas of the department really coming together and informing the fundamental science, the analytical chemistry, the separation science that Layla, you know, highlighted as being a traditional strength of the Barnett Institute and having a lot of people in the department involved in and then also thinking about the chemical biology and um, and you know, even to organismal biology, which of course is really not what people usually think of as chemistry, but to think about how to take that, the really um, fundamental biochemistry of what an organism is doing and then understand the chemistry of it to apply it to, to eventually reach a product, which is pretty amazing. But yeah, I think it's, it's really fabulous to see so many threads of the department being put together, the synthetic chemistry, the characterization, protein chemistry, chemical biology, even the physical chemistry when thinking about the optics. And so it's really all of the above intertwined in a, in a really groundbreaking way. 
Fantastic. I'm a huge fan of chemistry. I myself was a chemistry major and, uh, you know, just um, love chemistry. And I think, uh, you know, the point that Professor Duravi made where a student took a project from its inception into a company, this is something we are so proud of our absolutely off the charts, wonderful Northeastern students to, to do, to come in and to view the, the science as a power and a power that is not only fascinating, it's a power you can do something with to meet the challenges of the planet and to do so in ways that you can really do as an undergraduate or a graduate student. And we are so interested in supporting our undergraduate students in um, research projects, research opportunities, as well as our outstanding graduate students who we train for careers in science and innovation that are something the university can be proud of for years to come. So I want to thank Professor Daravi for really a brilliant talk. I want to congratulate you on your scholarship, Leila. It is just um, wonderful. You are one of our junior faculty that we are incredibly proud of. And I uh, thank you so much for taking your time today. I thank you so much, um, Professor Buning, for your wisdom and your introduction. Um, I want to thank um, everyone involved in organizing this event. Um, Kevin again and Diana Abronchuk, thank you so much. And thank you most of all, all of you in the audience for attending. We look forward to connecting with you further from the College of Science. We are so proud of our college and we are so proud of moving it to even greater excellence. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.